In this lesson, we are going to have um, a review on chapter two. So first, let us find the derivative in this equation. Now take note that this one involves x and y. We cannot solve for y in terms of x. So therefore, we make you we differentiate this using implicit differentiation. So getting the derivative of both sides of the equations, let us first start with the derivative of the left-hand side. We have derivative of log is just 1 over the argument, which is x to the 5 plus y cubed times ln of 3. But take note that we have to make use of chain rule here. We have two here. So we still have times the derivative of the second one. The derivative of the function inside is 5x4 plus derivative of y cubed with respect to x is 3y squared, but we still have dy over dx. Now on the right hand side, when we get the derivative of square root of e, what is that? That is just a constant. So therefore, the derivative with respect to x is just equal to 0. Next, we get the derivative of sine of x squared minus y. So again, take note that we are going to make use of chain rule here. Sine is, the derivative of sine is cosine, and then copy the argument, times the derivative of x squared minus y, which is 2x minus dy over dx. I will expand this so that I may um, collect all the terms involving dy and dx. So we have 5x4 over x5 plus y cubed ln of 3 plus 3y squared over x5 plus y cubed ln of 3 times dy over dx is equal to 2x times cosine x squared minus y minus dy over dx cosine of x squared minus y. So I just multiply the expressions and then I will put all the terms involving dy over dx on one side of the equation. So I have my 3y squared x5 plus y cubed ln of 3. That is this guy here. And then this one, I will put it on the other side. So it will be cosine x squared minus y dy dx. And then on this side, we have 2x cosine x squared minus y, and then put this on the other side, so minus this expression. Again, the reason why we are collecting all the terms involving dy dx on one side is so that we can factor out dy dx. So what will remain inside will be this expression. Then I'm just going to copy this expression on the right. And therefore, to solve for dy dx, we just divide both sides of the equation by this expression. So we now have that dy over dx is that expression on the right-hand side. All over the expression on the left-hand side. And that is now the answer. Next, we want to find the derivative of y equals cotangent inverse of 7 to the x raised to cosh of pi x or hyperbolic cosine of pi x. 
Now take note that this one involves a variable raised to a variable. And when we have something like that, what do we do? We always make use of logarithmic differentiation so that the exponent will go down. I will just get the ln of both sides first. And by the property of logarithms, we can now bring down the exponent cos of pi x. So this is cos of pi x times ln of cotangent inverse of 7 to the x. And then we now get the derivative of both sides, the derivative with respect to x. So the derivative of ln y is 1 over y times dy dx. For the right-hand side, we will... This involves a product, the product of cos pi x and ln of cotangent inverse of 7 to the x. Therefore, we use product rule. So I will write cos pi x and then times the derivative of ln of cotangent inverse 7 to the x plus copy the second function times the derivative of cos pi x. Now let me just put here the derivative of, what is the derivative of ln of cotangent inverse of 7 to the x? So derivative of ln, we just get the reciprocal of the argument. Again, we use chain rule. We have one, two, we have three functions here. So derivative of ln is one over the reciprocal of its argument, which is cotangent inverse seven to the x times. Derivative of cotangent inverse. Let us recall that the derivative of cotangent inverse x is negative one over one plus x squared. And therefore, derivative of cotangent inverse of 7 to the x is negative 1 over 1 plus 7 to the x squared times derivative of 7 to the x, the third. We're looking at the third one. So it's 7 to the x times ln of 7. Next, we need the derivative of cos pi x. That is simply sinh of pi x, but we still have a pi here. And therefore, plugging that in, I will plug in the derivative of ln of cotangent 7 to the x, which is negative 7 to the x ln 7 all over cotangent inverse 7 to the x times 1 plus 7 to the 2x and then plus ln of cotangent inverse of 7 to the x times the derivative of cos pi x which is pi sinh pi x. And therefore, our dy over dx is equal to y. But what is our y? Our y is cotangent inverse of 7 to the x raised to cos of pi x. That is my y. So that's y. And then times this expression on the right side. That is now our derivative. Next, we want to find the point slope form of the equation of the normal line to the graph of y equals cotangent pi x at x equals 1 half. Let's say that this is our graph. 
just for us to imagine it, we want to find the equation of the normal line. So to get the normal line, we first need the tangent line and then get the line perpendicular to that. Okay, so therefore, first we need our point and the slope of the normal line. Our normal line passes through this point, and what is that point? That is the point one half, and then f of one half. Okay, here my f of x is cotangent pi of x. All right, and then what will be our slope? The slope of the tangent line is f prime of one half, correct? But since what we want is the slope of the normal line, it is the negative reciprocal of f prime of one half. So first let us get the point one half f of one half. So let's find f of one half. F of one half is cotangent of pi over two. That is cosine pi over two all over sine pi over two. So that's zero. Next, we need F prime of one half from here. First, we need F prime of X derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared and then pi x then derivative of pi x which is pi and so f prime of one half is negative pi cosecant squared of pi over two but cosecant is the reciprocal of sine and sine of pi over two is equal to one so therefore this is negative pi and therefore we now have that the equation of the normal line in point slope form right it's y minus y sub zero m x minus x sub zero our point is one half f of one half is zero this one and then so this is y minus zero what is our slope it's the negative reciprocal of negative pi so that is equal to one over pi so one over pi times x minus one half next we want to determine if this one is differentiable at x equals 30. Now, whenever you have a piecewise function like this, remember that um, when you get the derivative, we just get the derivative of this one and this one, right? But remember that all the inequalities here will be strict inequality we really have to compute if f prime of three really does exist but even before we do that always remember that if a function is differentiable at x equals a then it must be continuous okay so therefore if if it is no longer continuous then it means that it is no longer differentiable, right? So let me just write that, not continuous. That is the quanta positive of the statement. Not continuous at x equals a means it is not differentiable at that point. So first, I will test for continuity. So for that, we want to make sure first that the limit exists, right? So the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the left, so we will make use of 3 plus x over 4 minus x. We can simply plug in 3, so that's 3 plus 3 over 4 minus 3, so that's equal to 6. Next, limit of f of x. As x approaches 3 from the right, we make use of x plus square root of 
to x plus 3 as x approaches 3 from the light. Again, we can simply plug it in. So we have 3 plus square root of 9, that is also equal to 6. So we just know that the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 is equal to 6. But take note that that is the same also as f of 3. Because to evaluate f of 3, we make use of this expression because we have here that x equals 3. And that is also equal to 6. So remember, when we're testing for continuity, this is what we want to show. The limit of the function as x approaches that number is equal to the value of the function at that number. It's just not a matter of showing that the limit exists. You have to show that that limit exists and it's equal to the value of the function at that number. Okay, so what we have seen is that this function is continuous and therefore we're now ready to get f prime of x. So what do we need to do there? We simply get the derivative of the expressions 3 plus x over 4 minus x and this one, except that the intervals here will now be strict inequalities. So here we're getting the derivative of 3 plus x over 4 minus x. So that's low squared low de high minus high de low, but the derivative of 4 minus x is positive, and this will now become x strictly less than 3. And then for the second one, we are getting the derivative of x plus 2x plus 3. So the, that's 1 plus, take note that this is 2x plus 3, raised to positive one half. So therefore, that will be one half times two x plus three raised to negative one half because one half minus one is negative one half times the derivative of two x plus three, which is two. So and this one is when x is greater than three. Let me just simplify this two, so the numerator would be seven over four minus x squared. X is less than three and this is one. This gets canceled out. So one plus one over square root of two x plus three when x is greater than three. And then we want to show that the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 3 from the left is the same as the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 3 from the right. And if this two quantities are the same, then that must be f prime of 3. So let's get limit of f prime of x as x approaches 3 from the left. So we make use of 7 over 4 minus x squared. And we can simply substitute 3, so we will get 7. Next, the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 3 from the right. So that is limit of 1 plus 1 over square root of 2x plus 3. But when we substitute, we get 1 over... 3, 1 plus 1 third, which is 4 thirds. So therefore, this one is not true. The limits are not the same. So therefore, f is not differentiable at x equals 3. Next, we want to find all values of a and b such that this function p of x equals tangent pi x if x is less than 3 and it's equal to ax squared minus b when x is greater than or equal to 3 is differentiable at x equals 3. So again, we start first with continuity to make sure that 
our function is differentiable, it must be continuous. So for that, we get limit of p of x as x approaches 3 from the left. So that's the limit of tangent by x. And that is tangent of 3 pi. Tangent of 3 pi sine of pi is 0 over negative 1. And then cosine is negative 1. So that is 0. Limit of p of x as x approaches 3 from the right. So that's limit of ax squared minus b as x approaches 3. And we can simply substitute. So that's 9a minus b. So what do we want? We want this two, 9a minus b, to be equal to 0 because that will be the limit. And take note that what is p of p of 3, by the way, that is 9a minus b also, right? So my point is that, okay, the limit has to exist first. And so 9a minus b must be equal to 0. So that is our first equation. So take note that we are solving for a and b here, so which means that we need to find two equations. Next, just like what we did in the previous example, we now get our p prime of x by getting the derivatives of the components tangent pi x. So let me just put here tangent pi x and ax squared minus b. So the derivative of tangent is secant squared pi x, but times the derivative of pi x with respect to x is pi. This is when x is less than 3, and then this one will become stick inequality. The derivative of ax squared minus b is 2ax. So we want limit of p prime of x as x approaches 3 from the left to be the same as the limit of p prime of x as x approaches 3 from the right. So from the left is pi secant squared 3 pi. Secant of pi is negative 1. So therefore, this is just equal to pi. Next, from the right, we are going to use 2ax. So therefore, this is 6a. So therefore, we want 6a to be equal to pi. That is our second equation, which means that from here, a is equal to pi over 6. And when I now substitute that, in 9a minus b equals 0, we have that b equals 9a, which is equal to 9 pi over 6, which is 3 pi over 2. So these are the only values. a must be pi over 6 and b must be 3 pi over 2. Next, we will recall the mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem. So for the mean value theorem, what we you have to make make sure that you're showing that the hypotheses are satisfied by the function. So just like in the intermediate value theorem, okay? So here we have a closed interval a, b, and first f must be continuous and it must also be differentiable. If that is the case, then there exists a C in AB such that, wait, let me just get this one. Let's say this is F of A. And then this one here is F of B. What is this F of B minus F of A? That is simply the slope of this line connecting A F of A and B F of B, right? This is the slope of the line containing the points A F of A and B F of B. And that slope will be equal to F prime of C for some C in AB. And from here in this diagram, what will be our C? It's this one. 
Notice that this line has the same slope as the red line. So I will make use of yellow there. So this is my C. Okay, and note that Rolle's theorem is simply, um, it's just MVT. It's just a specific case of MVT, but we just have that f of a and f of b must be equal to zero. So if we plug that in here in mean value theorem, f of a minus f of b equals zero, which means that f prime of c will now be equal to zero. So how will the function look like? This is my a and b. f of a and f of b are zero. So the the theorem is saying that definitely you will have values between A and B. So here I have three. It doesn't have to be one. But the point is that you will always have a horizontal tangent line if the function is continuous and differentiable on that closed interval. So here, definitely you will have horizontal tangent lines. Okay, so let's verify the mean value theorem in this function, g of x equals 3 raised to x. So, first we have to show that g is continuous on 0 pi. Why is this true? Note that g is a composition of the function, let's call it f of x equals 3 to the x and h of x, which is equal to sine x. So g of x is f circle g of x, right? So you apply first, uh, sorry, not g of x, it should be h of x. This is h of x. So what this is saying is you apply sine x first, right? And then you apply that to 3 raised to x. So for, for you to verify, this is f of h of x is sine x. So f of sine to the x is 3 raised to the sine x. And why, why am I saying that? It's because the exponential function 3 to the x and the function sine x are both continuous everywhere. So in particular, it is continuous on 0 pi, right? But, the compass, but if two functions are continuous, then their composition will also be continuous. So since f and h are continuous everywhere, then so is their composition g. So in particular, g is continuous on 0 pi. Next, is g differentiable on 0 pi? g is differentiable on 0 pi. When we compute g prime of x, that is simply 3 raised to sine x. That is an exponential function times ln of 3. And then we still have derivative of sine x, which is cosine x. And g prime of x exists everywhere. So therefore, g is actually differentiable everywhere. So therefore, in particular, it is differentiable on 0 pi. So what does the mean value theorem says? So by MVT, it says that there exists a C element of 0 to pi. That C is strictly between 0 to pi such that the derivative there is equal to the slope of the line containing these points. G of pi, that is 3 raised to sine 
pi minus 3 raised to sine 0 with over pi. But sine of pi is 0. Sine of 0 is also equal to 0. So that's 1 minus 1. Okay. So, by MVT, we know that there exists a C such that G prime of C equals 0. Now, let us find this C. So, uh, let me just write G prime of C earlier. We found that this is 3 raised to sine C. And then ln of 3 times cosine of C. And this one, we equate this to 0. Take note that this one will never be equal to 0. Correct? Because the graph of y equals 3 to the x, it will never be equal to 0, right? It does not intersect the x-axis. So, for this equation to happen, then we get that cosine of C must be equal to 0. But remember that our C is between 0 pi. So what are the only values of C? Cosine must be equal to 0. So C must be pi over 2. That's it. Next, we will graph this function and we are already given f prime of x and f double prime of x. So what is our domain? It's everything except negative 2 because we have our denominator here. Next, for our intercepts, for our x-intercept, you set y to 0, right? So which means that the numerator will be 0. So we have that x equals 1 and x equals 4. So as points, we have the points 1, 0, 4, 0, because y is equal to 0. For the y-intercept, set x equals 0. So we have y must be equal to negative 1 times negative 4 over 2 squared, so that's equal to 1. So as a point, this is the point 0, 1. x is 0, y is 1. Next, for the asymptotes, for the vertical asymptote, we just get it from our denominator, set the denominator to 0, so we have x equals negative 2. We have no whole because we have no common factors in the numerator and the denominator. For our horizontal asymptote, take note that the numerator is of degree 2 and also the denominator is degree 2. So therefore, the horizontal asymptote is, according to our theorem discussed during class, this is y equals leading coefficient of numerator over leading coefficient of the denominator, which is just equal to 1, 1 over 1. So that's 1. y equals 1. And of course, we have no oblique asymptote because it only occurs when the degree of the numerator is 1 more than the degree of the denominator. Next, for our table of values, this is for f prime of x. f prime of x, we have the factors x minus 2 and x plus 2 cube. So find the numbers for which x minus 2 is 0. So that occurs at 2. x plus 2 is 0 at negative 2. And then we cut our intervals there. And then for x minus 2, everything to the right of 2. x minus 2 is positive and then negative here. For x plus 2, everything to the right of negative 2, that's positive, and then negative. Next, for f double prime. f double prime of x is this one, 18 times 4 minus x 
over x plus 2 to the fourth. So we only need 4 minus x and x plus 2 raised to 4. Although, of course, this one will no longer contribute to the sign because of because we have an even exponent. It will always be positive. But still, we will include it. So let me just write here 4 minus x and x plus 2 cubed. 4 minus x will be 0 at x equals 4. x plus 2 will be 0 at negative 2. So we will cut our interval there. And then this is 4 minus x. So everything to the right of 4 will now be negative. It will be interchanged. Everything to the left of 4 is positive. x plus 2. Oops, sorry. This one should be 4. This one should be 4. But still x plus 2 raised to the fourth is always positive. So that's it. And then we will now superimpose the 2. I will just make these two lines for f prime and f double prime. So for f prime, our numbers are negative 2 and 2. For f double prime, we have negative 2 and 4. On f prime, on this interval, negative infinity to negative 2, it's positive, negative, positive. And then here, it's positive, positive, negative. And then I will just incorporate that. From negative 2 to 2, f prime is negative. 2 onwards, f prime is positive. For f double prime, So it's positive, negative 2 to 4, it's positive, positive, and then 4 onwards, it's negative. And then we will now get the shape. So for f double prime, it's concave up and it is increasing because of f prime. So therefore, we get that. Next. It is increasing, but f prime is negative, so that is decreasing. So we get this part. Next, it's concave up and it is increasing. So we get this part. And lastly, it is concave down and increasing. So we get the part which is increasing. Okay. So we are now ready to sketch the graph of our function. Okay, so first let me sketch the, let me plot the intercepts 1, 0, 4, 0. So 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 0. And the y-intercept 0, 1. What else? Asymptote x equals negative 2. And we have y equals 1 as a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so I have this one. So let's start now on the interval negative infinity to negative 2. Our graph will look like this one. We have a horizontal asymptote here and a vertical asymptote here and we're looking at this interval negative infinity to negative 2 our in our the shape of our graph is like this so how will it look like so it will now become like this it will approach your horizontal asymptote it will approach your vertical asymptote next on the interval negative 2 to 2 so negative 2 to 2 so take note that our graph has to, to pass through here and here. And I have a vertical asymptote here. Take note that the graph can intersect the horizontal asymptote because the horizontal asymptote, it's telling us that the graph will not intersect that on the left side. It's, it's just for the tails, the left side and the right side. But in the middle, the graph can definitely pass through that line. So the graph has this shape. So how will the graph look like? 
So it will now be like this. It will be like that. And then let's say this is two. So definitely it will probably go down. We don't know where. Next, from two to in two to four. Okay, the graph will look like this. And I already have a point here, and this is the point four zero. And the graph is like this. So I will just connect them with that shape. And lastly, from four to infinity. The graph has this shape and take note that it has a horizontal asymptote here. So therefore, the graph is like this. Okay. Oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned the relative max and the relative mean. Even if we haven't sketched the graph, let's just see where the um, sign changes. In F prime, okay, so let's look at the relative max even if... Suppose that we haven't graphed it yet. If we look at this, it's as if that negative 2 will be a relative extremum, right? Because there is a change of sign here. However, take note that negative 2 is not part of your domain. So it cannot be a critical number in the first place. And it, when we verify that in our graph, at x equals negative 2, we actually have a vertical asymptote. So definitely negative, you cannot have a relative extremum at x equals negative 2. Next, let's look at 2 here. There is a change of sign. So this is decreasing and then increasing. So it tells us that you have a relative mean there. Let us verify that from the graph. Yes, we actually have a relative mean here, relative mean. And then for F double prime, we have a change of sign at 4, correct? So at x equals 4 there, so we have a POI here. And if you go back to your function, uh, there, so here, f double prime of 4 is equal to 0. Now, so it's really a possible point of inflection, and it turns out to be indeed a point of inflection. Okay, but if we want to find, let's say, this exact point, what is that point relative mean? So we just know that it occurs at x equals 2. So all we have to do is to plug it in the value of f. So our f of x again is x minus 1, x minus 4 over x plus 2 squared. So therefore, our f of 2 is 1 times 2 minus 4, negative 2 over 4. So that's negative 1 half. So there, our relative point occurs at x equals 2. So that's the point 2, negative 1 half. So be careful with that. Huh? The relative minimum value occurs when x equals 2, but the relative minimum value is, the y-coordinate is, negative 1 half.